Now let us go on and look at mountains. The Quran has more than a dozen verses stating that God placed firm and unmovable mountains on the earth. And in some of these verses, the mountains are listed as either a blessing for believers or a warning for the unbelievers. One example of this is found in the Surah Luqman, 31, 10, 11, where the mountains are one of five warnings. It says, he, was crea he has created the heavens, it says he has created the heavens without supports that you can see, and has cast Elka onto the earth firm mountains, Rawasya, lest it should shake with you. In the prophets, the Lenevia, 2131, as one of seven warnings, we read, and we have set on the earth firm mountains, lest it should shake with you, with them. Finally, in the B, Nahal 1615, says, and we, he has cast Elka onto the earth firm mountains, Rawasya, lest it should shake with you. We see then that the believers and unbelievers are told that Allah has done this great thing. He's thrown down and placed the mountains so that the earth will not shake violently with them. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, what did they understand? In the next two verses, another picture is given. The news, Anaba 7867. Have we not made the earth an expanse and the mountains as stakes? El Jibala Otaiden, as those used to anchor a tent in the ground. And then the overwhelming, El Gashia. 88, 17, 19. Do they, the unbelievers, not look at the mountains, El Jibal, how they've been pitched like a tent? Here men are told that the mountains are placed as tent pegs. Tent pegs keep the tent stable. So again, the idea is put forward that the pegs, the mountains, will keep the earth from shaking. A third picture is presented in the word rawasya, used for mountains. This word comes from the Arabic root arsa. And the same root is used for the Arabic word for anchor. To throw out or cast the anchor is el ka al mirsa. So instead of cast the anchor to keep the ship from moving, we have cast the mountains to keep the earth from shaking. From these pictures, it is clear that Muhammad's followers understood that the mountains were thrown down like tent pegs to keep a tent in place, like an anchor to hold a ship in place, to stop the earth from moving, i.e. limit earthquakes. But in fact, this is false. The forming of mountains causes earthquakes. Therefore, these verses present a definite problem. Dr. Maurice Bukai recognized this and discussed them in his book, The Bible, the Quran, and Science. After quoting the above verses about mountains, he says, modern geologists describe the folds in the earth as giving foundation to the mountains. And the stability of the earth's crust results from this phenomenon of these folds. When asked about this, Professor of Geology, Dr. David A. Young says, while it is true that many mountain ranges are composed of folded rock and the folds may be of large scale, it's not true that the folds render the crust stable. The very existence of the folds is evidence of instability in the crust. In other words, mountains don't keep the earth from shaking. Their formation caused and still causes the surface of the earth to shake. Geological theories at the present time propose that the hardened crust of the earth is made of sections or plates, which slowly move in relation to each other. Sometimes the plates separate, like North and South America separating from Europe and Asia, and Europe and South Africa. And sometimes they go together, and they slide next to each other, and they bump into each other. And then they cause earthquakes. An example this time of mountain formation is found in the Middle East, where the migration of Arabia toward Iran has resulted in the Zygros range in, in Iran. In many parts of the world, as one travels along the roads, one sees a hillside where the sandstone layers, which were horizontal when they were deposited, are now sticking up at angles. And so here you can see these sandstone layers, which were horizontal in the beginning, now they're sticking up at 75 degrees, where they've been, they were pushed up there by an earthquake, by the mountains being formed. Sometimes the plates get caught on each other and stop sliding. During this period, great forces are built up, 
When the forces of friction are overcome, the piece of plate that was stuck lurches forward, causing the shock wave of a thrust quake. And all of a sudden, it goes thunk like this. In a recent earthquake, it was calculated that the Cocos Plate in Mexico suddenly jumped forward three meters. Well, if your house suddenly jumped three meters, it would be a catastrophe. Another type of, mo of mountain is that formed by volcanoes. Lava and ash from inside the earth are thrown out and piled up until a high mountain is formed, even from the bottom of the sea. And we can see this kind of action in this picture. I hope you can see it. Not clear, is it? The ocean crust is right here. And the continental crust is there. And the oceanic crust is going down under the continental crust. And mountains have been formed here. Here's a volcano, and here is the magma, or the molten rock, going up through the volcano. And here's another volcano with magma going up. And so this is how the mountains are formed, and earthquakes are formed. In the case of some igneous mountains, molten rock intrudes into the throat of a volcano's opening and cools, form a relatively dense intrusion, which extends below the surface of the Earth. So this, if this got stuck and sealed, then it would be like a plug. However, it's not a root. It does not bear the weight of the mountain. It's really a plug. Therefore, on occasion, pressure builds up under the plug and the volcano explodes, as happened in the South Pacific at Krakatoa in 1883, when the whole island was blown away. And it happened in Mount St. Helena in our days, when the mountain was blown away. We can conclude from this information that mountains were formed originally with movement and shaking, and that now, in the present, earthquakes are caused by their continued formation. When the plates buckle over each other, there are earthquakes. When the volcanoes erupt, there can be earthquakes. However, it is clear that the followers of Muhammad were understanding these verses to say that Allah threw the mountains down as a tent pegs or anchors to keep the earth from shaking. Throwing the mountains down into the earth may be poetry, but to say that mountains keep the earth from shaking is a severe difficulty, which is out of step with modern science. Now we're going to take a little look at what the sun says about about the Quran says about the sun. In the Surah of the Kaf, 1886, it says, until when Zul Kornain, that's Alexander the Great, reached the setting of the sun, he found it set in a spring of murky water. I'm sorry, in 20th century science, 20th century science, the sun does not set in a spring of murky water. And then in the criterion of Furqan 2545 to 46, it says, hast thou not turned thy vision to thy Lord, how he prolongs the shadow? If he willed, he could make it stationary. Then do we, God, make the sun its guide. What about this? As the sun's, if you think of the sun overhead, you have no shadow or a little tiny shadow. And then as the sun goes down, your shadow gets longer on the other side. Well, the sun is stationary in relation to the earth. It's not what causes the shadow to shift. The rotating earth guides the shadows. So if you demand 20th century accuracy, the Sora should say the rotating earth causes the shadows to change. I will look at a different subject. Solomon's death. Whether this is science, I don't know. Maybe sociology. Solomon's dead. He's propped up on his staff. It says the jinn's work for him as Solomon desired. Then when we decreed death upon Solomon, nothing showed them his death except the little creeping creature of the earth, which gnawed away his staff. And when he fell, the jinn's came clearly, saw clearly how if they had known the unseen, they would not have continued in the humiliating penalty of work. So here's Solomon. 
He's dead. He's propped up on his staff, like a wakaf in Morocco overseeing only a road gang. And no cook comes to ask him for what he wants for dinner. And no general comes for orders. And none of his mo nobles come to say, let's go hunting. No one notices. I'm sorry. I do not believe this story. And it won't fit, fit 20th century sociology or 7th century sociology, where the king would never be left alone like that. Now finally, let us look at milk. It says in the Surah of the Bee, Anahal 1666, we pour out to you from what is within their cattle, in their abdomen, the cattle's abdomen, between excretions and blood, milk pure and agreeable to the drinkers. The abdomen where the intestines are, sorry, in 20th century medical science, the abdomen where intestines are is where the intestines are. The mammary glands are under the skin. In humans, they're under the skin here. In cattle, they're under the skin between the legs. No connection. There's no connection between the breasts and the intestines and their feces in any way. Feces, though in the body, it really is outside of the animal. Animal's finished with it. It's not connected to milk or to anything else. And finally, I'm going to look at communities. The Surah of the Cattle, El An, El Anam, 638. There is not an animal on the earth, nor a being that flies on two wings, but forms communities like you. Speaks about no animal on earth, not a being that flies. And then it says that every one of them is communities like you. And I assume that the Quran is speaking about we humans. Well. Some fly, in some spiders, when they finish mating, the mother eats the father. Well, I'm glad that my wife didn't eat me. Even in bees, the extra male drones are thrown out to die. Well, I'm glad also that after I, we had four children that my wife didn't push me out of the house, too. Finally, the lions. When a lion gets old, a male lion gets old, a young lion comes along and drives him away from his own wives. And the young lion takes over the wives. But what he does with the cubs, the cubs of the old lion, he kills them all. So I do not think that this sentence is true. All of the communities are, and all of the animals do not live in communities like us. In conclusion, it is clear that the Koran has many scientific errors. As a generality, the Koran mirrors and reflects the science of its time, the science of the 7th century AD. We came here to seek truth. I've done my best to present valid information. If you want to see all the references, my book, The Koran and the Bible in the Light of History and Science, is for sale outside that door at a bargain price tonight. May the God of all truth guide you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Campbell, for your presentation. Now we have Brother Sabil Ahmed presenting an introduction of our next speaker, Dr. Zakir Naik. Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. It is my pleasure to introduce one of the best scholars of our time, Dr. Zakir Abdul Karim Naik, aged 34 years old. He is the president of Islamic Research Foundation, Bombay, India. Though a medical doctor with professional training, Dr. Zakir Naik is known as a dynamic international orator on Islam and comparative religion. Dr. Zakir Naik clarifies Islamic viewpoints and clears misconceptions about Islam based upon the Quran, Hadith, and other religious scriptures as well as adhering to reason, logic, and scientific facts. He is popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions. 
posed by audiences after his public talks. He appears regularly on many international TV and satellite TV channels, programs in several countries of the world. He has authored books on Islam and comparative religion. He has also participated in several symposiums and dialogues with prominent personalities of other religious faiths. Ladies and gentlemen, may I call upon Dr. Zakir Naik to present his talk. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam, ala rasulillah, wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain, amma abad. Auz billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi, wa fi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyina lom annahu laqs, awalam yakfi bi rabbika, annahu, ala kulli shayin shaheed, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim, rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yasir li amri, Respected Dr. William Campbell, Dr. Marakas, Dr. Jamal Badwi, Brother Samuel Noman, Dr. Muhammad Naik, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters. I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of today's dialogue is the Quran and the Bible in the light of science. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. For any book to claim that it is a revelation from Almighty God. It should stand the test of time. Previously in the olden days, it was the age of miracles. Alhamdulillah. The Quran is the miracle of miracles. Later on came the age of literature and poetry. And Muslims and non-Muslims alike, they claim the glorious Quran to be the best Arabic literature available on the face of the earth. But today is the age of science and technology. Let us analyze whether the Quran is compatible or incompatible with modern science. Albert Einstein said, science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. Let me remind you that the glorious Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. -S. It's a book of ayats. And there are more than 6,000 signs, ayats, in the glorious Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about signs. As far as my talk regarding Quran and signs is concerned, I will only be speaking about scientific facts which have been established. I will not be speaking about scientific hypotheses and theories which are based on assumption without any proof because we all know many a times science takes U-turns. Dr. William Campbell, who wrote a reply to the book of Dr. Morris Bukhale, the Quran, the Bible in the light of history and science, he says in his book that there are two types of approaches. One is a concordance approach, which means a person tries to bring a compatibility between the scripture and science. And the other is the conflict approach in which a person tries to bring a conflict between scripture and science like how Dr. William Campbell has done very well. But as far as the Quran is concerned, irrespective whether a person uses a conflicting approach or a concordance approach, as long as you're logical, and after a logical explanation is given to you, not a single person will be able to prove a single verse of the Quran in conflict with established modern science.
Dr. William Campbell has pointed out various alleged scientific errors in the Quran, and I'm supposed to actually refute in the rebuttal, but since he chose to speak first, I will be refuting a few points in my talk. I will reply to the major part of his talk, mainly dealing with embryology and with geology. The remaining, inshallah, inshallah, I will try my level best to reply in the rebuttal. I have to do both. I can't do injustice to the topic. The topic is Quran and Bible in the light of science. I can't only speak about one scripture. Dr. William Campbell hardly spoke about one or two points about the Bible, which I shall deal with, inshallah. I will speak about both, inshallah. I want to do justice to the topic. As far as Quran and modern science is concerned, in the field of astronomy, the scientists, the astronomers, a few decades earlier, they described how the universe came into existence. They call it the Big Bang. And they said initially, there was one primary nebula, which later on, it separated with a Big Bang, which gave rise to galaxies, stars, sun, and the earth we live in. This information is given in a nutshell in the glorious Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, which says, Awalam yara lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see, anna samawati wal arda, that the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. Imagine, this information which they came to know recently, the Quran mentions 1400 years ago. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun, in respect to the earth, it was stationary. The earth and the moon, they rotated about the axis, but the sun was stationary. But when I read a verse of the Quran saying, in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 33, it says, Huwa lazi khalaqa layl wa nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa shams wa kamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi falaki yasbahoon. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. Now, alhamdulillah, modern science has confirmed the Quranic statement. The Arabic word used in the Quran is yasbahoon, which describes the motion of a moving body. When it refers to a celestial body, it means it is rotating about its own axis. So Quran says the sun and the moon, they revolve as well as rotate about their own axis. Today we have come to know that the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. It was Edwin Hubble who discovered that the universe is expanding. The Quran says in Surah Dharyat, chapter 51, verse number 47, that we have created the expanding universe, the vastness of space. The Arabic word mosiona refers to vastness, the expanding universe. Regarding the topics on astronomy which Dr. William Campbell touched, I will deal in the rebuttal, inshallah. In the field of water cycle, Dr. William Campbell pointed out certain things. The Quran describes the water cycle in great detail. And Dr. William Campbell mentioned four stages. In his book, he mentions 4A and B. The last one he didn't mention in the slide, I don't know why. It says that replenishing the water table, he missed out here, maybe because not mentioned in the Bible. He said, there is not a single verse in the Quran which speaks about evaporation. Quran says in Surah Tariq, chapter number 86, verse number 11, Rajas Sama that by the capacity of the heavens to return. And almost all the commentators of the Quran, they said that this verse of Surah Tariq, chapter 86, verse number 11, refers to the capacity of the heaven to return back rain, meaning evaporation. Dr. William Campbell, who knows Arabic, may say, why didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mention was samai zatil matar, meaning the capacity of the heaven to return back rain? Why didn't Allah mention specifically? Now we have come to know why didn't Allah do that in his divine wisdom. Because today we have come to know that besides the ozonosphere, the layer above the earth, besides returning back rain, it even returns back other beneficial matter and energy of the earth which is required by the human beings. It does not only return back rain, today we have come to know it even returns back waves of telecommunication of television, of radio, by which we can see TV, we can communicate, we can hear the radio. 
And besides that, it even returns back the harmful rays of the outer space back on the other side and absorbs. For example, the ultraviolet rays of the sunlight is absorbed by the ionosphere. If this was not done, life on the earth would have ceased to exist. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is far superior and far more accurate when it says, Raja Sama, by the capacity of the heaven to return. And the remaining things, as he mentioned, is there in the Quran. You can refer to my video because I said, the Quran describes the water cycle in great detail. Regarding what he said about the Bible, he showed stage one and stage three in the first slide. And the second, stage one, three, and then two. That the rainwater is taken up, he says, and then the rainwater comes on the earth. This is the philosophy of phase of Miletus in 7th century BC. He thought that the spray of the ocean was picked up by the wind and fell into the interior as rain. There's no cloud mentioned there. In the second quotation Dr. William Campbell gave, first is according to him evaporation, which we agree, we don't mind having the concordance approach to the Bible. Then rain falls down and then other clouds formed. That is not the complete water cycle. Alhamdulillah, the Quran describes the water cycle in great detail, in several places. How does the water rise, evaporates, form into clouds, the clouds join together, they stack up, there's thunder and lightning, water comes down, the clouds move into the interior, they fall down as rain, and the replenishing of the water table, and alhamdulillah, in great detail. The Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail in several places. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48. In Surah Azumur, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 18. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse number 24. In Surah Al-Hijr, chapter 15, verse number 22. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 57. In Surah Raj, chapter number 13, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 40 and 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter 36, verse number 34. In Surah Jasha, chapter 45, verse number 5. In Surah Qaf, chapter number 50, verse number 9. In Surah Waqiyah, chapter number 56, verse number 16 and 17. In several places, Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 30, the glorious Quran speaks about the water cycle in great detail. <laughs> Dr. William Campbell spent maximum time on embryology, about half his talk, quite a lot on geology and touched on other six topics. I've noted down. In the field of geology we have come to know today, the geologists tell us that the radius of the Earth is approximately 3,750 miles. And the deeper layers, they are hot and fluid and cannot sustain life. And the superficial part of the Earth's crust which we live on, it is very thin. Hardly 1 to 30 miles. Some portions are thicker, but majority 1 to 30 miles. And there are high possibility that this superficial layer, the Earth's crust, it will shake. It is due to the folding phenomena, which gives rise to mountain ranges, which gives stability to this Earth. Quran says, in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7, we have made the Earth as an expanse, while Jabala Autada, and the mountains as stakes. The Quran doesn't say mountains were thrown up as stakes. Mountains as stakes. Arabic word autad means stakes, meaning tent peg. And today we have come to know, in the study of modern geology, that mountain has got deep roots. This was known in the second half of the 19th century. And the superficial part that we see of the mountain is a very small percentage. The deeper part is within. Exactly like a stake, how it is driven in the ground. You can only see a small part on top, the majority is down in the ground. Or like a tip of the iceberg, you can see the tip on the top, and about 90% is beneath water. The Quran says, in Surah Ghashiyah, chapter 88, verse number 19, and Surah Naziyat, chapter number 79, verse number 32. Wal Jibala Arsaha, and we have made the mountain standing firm on the earth. Made the mountain standing firm on the earth. Today, after modern geology has advanced, and Dr. William Campbell said that, by the theory of plate tectonics, it was propounded in 1960, which gives rise to mountain ranges, the geologists today do say that 
the mountains give stability to the earth. Not all geologists, but many do say. I have not come across a single geological book, and I challenge Dr. William Campbell to produce a single geological book, not his personal correspondence with the geologist. That doesn't carry weight. His personal correspondence with Dr. Keith Moore, documented proof. And if you read the book, The Earth, which is referred by almost all the universities in the field of geology, one of its authors by the name of Dr. Frank Press, who was the advisor to the former president of USA, Jimmy Carter, and was the president of the Academy of Sciences of USA. He writes in his book that the mountains are west shaped, it has deep roots within, and he says that the function of the mountain is to stabilize the earth. And the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 31, in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 10, as well as in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 15, that we have made the mountain standing firm on the earth, lest it would shake with them and with you. The function of the mountain in the Quran is given to prevent the earth from shaking. Nowhere does the Quran say that the mountain prevents the earthquake. And Dr. William Campbell said, he writes in his book and even the talk, that you find in the mountainous regions there are various earthquakes, and mountains cause earthquake. Point to be noted, nowhere does the Quran say that mountain prevents earthquake. The Arabic word for earthquake, as Dr. William Campbell knows Arabic, is zilzal or zalzala. But the words used in these three verses I quoted, it is tamida. Tamida means to shake, to sway, to swing. And Quran says in Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse number 10, as well as Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 15, we have put on the earth mountain standing firm, lest it would shake with you. It is tamida bikum, shake with you, indicating if the mountains were not there, if you would have walked, if you would have moved, even the earth would have moved with you. If you would have swayed, even the earth would have swayed with you. And we know normally when we walk on the earth, the earth doesn't shake. And the reason for this is, According to Dr. Frank Press and Dr. Majar, who's from Saudi Arabia, and he wrote a full book on geological concepts in the Quran, answering almost everything what Dr. William Campbell has said in detail. And Dr. William Campbell, in his book, he writes that if mountains prevent the shaking of the earth, then how come you find earthquake in the mountainous regions? I said, nowhere does the Quran say mountain prevents earthquake. Earthquake is Rizal. And if you see the definition in the Oxford Dictionary, it says, earthquake is due to convulsion of the superficial crust of the earth due to release of compressed seismic waves due to crack in the rock or due to volcanic reaction. The Quran speaks about Zalzala in Surah Zalzal, chapter 99, but here it speaks about Tamida Bikum, to prevent the earth from shaking with you. And in reply to the statement that if mountains prevent earthquakes, how come you find earthquakes in mountainous region? The reply is that if I say that medical doctors, they prevent the sickness and disease in a human being, and if someone argues, if doctors prevent the sickness and diseases in a human being, how come you find more sick people in the hospital where there are doctors than at home where there are no doctors? In the field of oceanology, the glorious Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse number 53, that it is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water, one sweet and palatable, the other salt and bitter. Though they meet, they do not mix. Between them, there is a barrier which is forbidden to be test passed. Quran says in Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse number 19 and 20, Marajal bahrain yal takhyan, It is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they do not mix. Between them, there is a barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Previously, the commentator of the Quran wondered, what does the Quran mean? We know about sweet and salt water, but between them, there is a barrier. Though they meet, they do not mix. Today, after advancement of oceanology, we have come to know that whenever one type of water flows into the other type of water, it loses its constituents and gets homogenized into the water it flows. There is a slanting, homogenizing area which the Quran refers to as barzakh, unseen barrier. And this has been agreed upon by several scientists, even of America, by the name of Dr. Hay. He's oceanologist. 
and Dr. William Campbell writes in his book that it is an observable phenomena. The fishermen of that time knew there were two types of water, salt and sweet. So Prophet Muhammad, during the expedition to Syria, he may have gone in the sea, or he might have spoken to these fishermen. Sweet and salt water is an observable phenomena, I agree. But people did not know that there was an unseen barrier until recently. The scientific point to be noted here is the barzakh, not the sweet and the salt water. In the field of embryology, Sir William Campbell spent approximately half of his talk on that. Time will not permit me to reply to every small thing which are illogical. I'll just give a brief reply, which will be satisfactory, inshallah. And for more details, you can refer to my video cassette, Quran Modern Science, and my other cassettes on Quran and Medical Science. There were a group of Arabs who collected the data dealing in the Quran about embryology and the hadith dealing with embryology, and they presented it to Professor Keith Moore, who was the chairman and the head of the Department of Anatomy in the University of Toronto in Canada. And at present, he's one of the leading scientists in the field of embryology. After reading the various translations of the Quran, he was asked to comment and he said, most of the verses of the Quran and the Hadith are in perfect conformity with modern embryology. But there are a few verses which I cannot say that they are right. Neither can I say that they are wrong because I myself don't know about it. And two such verses were the first two verses of the Quran to be revealed from Surah Ikra or Surah Alak, chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2, which says, Ikra bismi rabbikal ladhi khalak. Khalak al insana min alak. Read, recite, or proclaim in the name of thy Lord, who created, who created the human beings from something which clings a leech-like substance. Regarding Dr. William Campbell's statement that to analyze the meaning of a word, you have to see what was the meaning at that time when it was revealed, at that time when the book was written. And he rightly said that to analyze the meaning, you have to analyze the meaning at the time it was revealed and to the people who it was meant for. As far as this statement of his is concerned, regarding the Bible, I do agree with it totally because the Bible was only meant for the children of Israel for that time. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 10, verse number 5 and 6. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, tells his disciples, go ye not in the way of the Gentiles. Who are the Gentiles? The non-Jews, the Hindus, the Muslims. But rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jewish Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 15, verse number 24, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus Christ and the Bible were only meant for the children of Israel. Since it was meant for them to analyze the Bible, you have to use the meaning of the word which was utilized at that time. But the Quran was not meant only for the Arabs of that time. Quran is not meant only for the Muslims. The Quran is meant for the whole of humanity. And it is meant to be for eternity. Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse 52, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse 185, and Surah Zumar, chapter 39, verse 41, that the Quran is meant for the whole of humankind. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Bama illa rahmat that we have sent thee as a mercy, as a guidance to the whole of humankind. So as far as the Quran is concerned, you cannot limit the meaning only for that time because it is meant for eternity. So one of the meanings of alaka is leech-like substance or something which clings. So Professor Keith Moore said, I do not know whether the early stage of embryo looks like a leech. And he went in his laboratory and he analyzed the early stage of an embryo under a microscope and compared it with a photograph of a leech and he was astonished at the striking resemblance. This is the photograph of a leech and human embryo. What Dr. William Campbell showed you is the other perspective of it. If I show this book, it looks like a rectangle. If I show you like that, it's a different perspective. <laughs> that diagram is given in the book. 
The diagram will show on the slide is even there, and I'll deal with it, inshallah. Professor Keith Moore, after about 80 questions asked to him, he said, if you would have asked me these 80 questions 30 years ago, I would not be able to answer more than 50%, because embryology has developed recently in the past 30 years. He said this in the 80s. Now, do we believe in Dr. Keith Moore, whose statement is available outside in the foyer, if video cassettes are available, this is the truth, unknown, huh? recorded statement. So will you believe Dr. William Campbell's personal conversation with Professor Keith Moore? Or the one mentioned in this book, with Islamic edition, as well as the photograph that I've shown to you. And in the video cassette available outside, you can see it. He makes those statements. So you have to choose which is more logical, personal discussion with Dr. William Campbell, or his statement on video, like how Dr. William Campbell showed my video. 100% proof what I said. Moon is reflected light, I'll come to it later on. <laughs> and whatever additional information he got from Quran and Hadith, it was incorporated later into this book, The Developing Human, the third edition. And this book got an award for the best medical book written by a single author in that year. This is the Islamic edition that was put forward by Sheikh Abdul Majid Zindani and certified by Keith Moore himself. The Quran says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 13, and Surah Hajj, chapter 22, verse number 5, and no less than 11 different places in the Quran that the human beings have been made from anutfa, a minute quantity of liquid. Like a trickle that's remaining in the cup, not fine Arabic, a very small quantity. Today we have come to know in one seminal emission, in which there are several millions of sperm, only one is required to fertilize the ovum, the Quran refers as nutfa. Quran says in Surah Sajda, chapter 32, verse number 8, we have created the human beings from solala. That means the best part of a whole. The one sperm which fertilizes the ova, out of the millions of sperm, the Quran refers to as sulala, best part of the whole. And Quran says in Surah Insan, chapter 76, verse number 2, we have created the human beings from Nutfad and Amshaj, a minute quantity of mingled fluid, referring to the sperm as well as the ovum. Both are required for the fertilization. The Quran describes the various embryological stages in great detail, of which the slides were shown to you by Dr. William Campbell. He helped me to complete this topic. It's mentioned Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 12 to 14. The translation is that we have created the human beings from anutfa, a minute quantity of liquid, then placed it in akrar e makin a place of security. Then we made it into an alaka, a leech-like substance, something which clings, a congealed clot of blood. Then we made that alaka into a mudga, a chewed-like lump. Then we made the mudga into izama, bones. Then clothed the bones with lamb, flesh. Then we made it a new creature. Blessed be Allah, who's the best to create. These three verses of the Quran speak about the various embryologic stages in great detail. First, the nutfa, placed in a place of security, made into an alaka. Alaka has got three meanings. One is something which clings, and we know that in the initial stages, the embryo clings to the uterine wall and continues clinging till the end. Point number two, that it also means a leech-like substance. And as I discussed earlier, the embryo in the initial stages does look like a leech. Besides looking like a leech, it also behaves like a leech. It receives its blood supply from the mother, like a blood sucker. And the third meaning, which Dr. William Campbell objected to, that that is the right meaning, the congealed clot of blood, and that's why Quran has a scientific error. And I do agree with him that Dr. William Campbell didn't agree. He said, how can it mean a congealed clot of blood? Because this is the case, and the Quran is wrong. I'm sorry to say, Quran is not wrong. Dr. William Campbell, with due respect to him, he's wrong. Because today, Today, after advancement of embryology, 
Even Dr. Keith Moore, he says that in the initial stages, the embryo, besides looking like a leech, also looks like a congealed clot of blood. Because in the initial stages of the stage of alaka, three to four weeks, the blood is clotted within closed vessels. And Dr. William Campbell made it easy for me. He showed you a slide. It will be difficult for you to see, but this is the slide he showed you. This is exactly what Professor Keith Moore said looks like a clot, in which the blood is clotted within closed vessels, and during the third week of the embryo, the blood circulation doesn't take place. It starts later on. Therefore, it assumes the appearance of a clot. And even if you observe the conceptus, that's after abortion takes place, you can see it looks like a clot. Only one line answer is sufficient to answer all the allegations of Dr. William Campbell is that the stages of the Quran, while it describes the embryological stages, is only based on appearance. Appearance. First is the appearance of a alaka, a leech-like substance, as well as a clot of blood. And Dr. William Campbell rightly said that some ladies come and ask, please remove the clot. It does look like a clot. And the stages are based on appearance. It is created from something which appears like a clot, which appears like a leech, and is also something which clings. Then the Quran says we made that alaka into a mudga, a chewed like lump. Professor Keith Moore took plaster seal and bit between his teeth to make it look like a mudga. The teeth mark resembled the somites. Dr. William Campbell said, when the alaka becomes a mudga, the clinging is yet there. It is dead late and half months. So, the Quran is wrong. I told you in the beginning, the Quran is describing the appearance. The leech-like appearance and the clot-like appearance is changed to the chewed-like appearance. It yet continues to cling till the end. There's no problem. But the stages are divided on appearance, not on the function. Later on, Quran says, we made the mudga into izama bones. Then clothed the bones with flesh. Sir William Campbell said, and I do agree with him that the precursors of the muscles and the cartilages, that is the bones, they form together. I agree with that. Today, embryology tells us that the primordia of the muscles and the bones, they form together between the 25th and the 40th day, which the Quran refers to as the stage of mudga. But they are not developed. They are not developed. Later on, at the end of the seventh week, the embryo takes form of human appearance. Then the bones are formed. Today, modern embryology says the bones are formed after the 42nd day. And it gives an appearance of a skeletal thing. Even at this stage, when the bones are formed, the muscles aren't formed. Later on, after the seventh week and the starting of eighth week, are the muscles formed. So Quran is perfect in describing first alaka, then mudga, then izaman, then clothed with flesh. And when they form, the description is perfect. And Professor Keith Moore said that the stages that how it is described in modern embryology, stage one, two, three, four, five, it's so confusing. The Quranic stage on embryology describing on the base of appearance and the shape is far more superior. Alhamdulillah. Therefore he said, Therefore, he said that I have no objection in accepting that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God and that this glorious Quran has to be a divine revelation from Almighty God. It's mentioned in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 56. It speaks about pain. Previously, the doctors, they thought that the brain was only responsible for feeling of pain. Today we have come to know, besides the brain, there are certain receptors in the skin which are responsible for feeling of the pain, which we call as pain receptors. Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, 56, that as to those who reject our signs, we shall cast them into the hellfire, and as often as their skins are roasted, we shall give them fresh skin so that they shall feel the pain. Indicating there is something in the skin which is responsible for feeling of pain, which the Quran refers to as pain receptors. Professor Takla Takashan, who is the head of the Department of Anatomy in Chiang Mai University in Thailand, only on the basis of this one verse, he proclaimed the Shahada in the 8th Medical Conference in Riyadh 
and said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. That there's no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. I started my talk by quoting the verse of the glorious Quran from Surah Fusila chapter 41 verse 53 which says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaki, wa fi anfusihim, hatta yatabayyina lawm anna uhlaq, awalam yakfi bi rabbika, anna wala kulle shayin shaheed, that soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest region of the horizons and into their soul until it is clear to them that this is the truth. This one verse was sufficient to prove to Dr. Takra Takashan that Quran is a divine revelation. Some may require 10 signs. Some may require 100. Some, even after a 1,000 signs are given, they will not accept the truth. Quran calls such people as, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 18, summum, bukmun, umyun, fahum la arjiun, the deaf, the dumb, the blind, they will not return the true path. The Bible says the same thing in Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 13, verse number 13. Seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither will they understand. Regarding the other parts of embryology, I will deal in my rebuttal, inshallah, if time permits. I have to do justice to the other part also, regarding Bible and the right of science. At the outset, let me tell you that Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse 38, that we have given several revelations. By name, only four are mentioned. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation, which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. The Zabur is the Wahi, which was given to David, peace be upon him. The Injil is the Wahi, the revelation, which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation, which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Let me make it very clear to everyone that this Bible, which the Christians believe to be the word of God, is not the Injil which we Muslims believe was revealed to Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. This Bible, according to us, it may contain the words of God, but it also contains words of prophets, words of historians. It contains absurdities, obscenity, as well as innumerable scientific errors. If there are scientific points mentioned in the Bible, there are possibilities, why not? It may be part of the word of God in the Bible, but what about the scientific errors? What about the unscientific portion? Can you attribute this to God? I want to make it very clear to my Christian brothers and sisters. The purpose of my presentation on Bible and science is not to hurt any Christian's feeling. If while presenting, if I hurt your feelings, I do apologize in advance. The purpose is only to point out that a God's revelation cannot contain scientific errors. As Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, search ye the truth, and the truth shall free you. You have the Old Testament, you have the New Testament. Now you should follow the last and final testament, which is the glorious Quran. As far as Dr. William Campbell is concerned, I can be more liberal with him because he has written a book, Quran, Bible in the Light of History and Science. He has given a presentation and he's a medical doctor. I don't have to be very formal with him. As far as the other Christian brothers and sisters are concerned, I apologize if I hurt your feelings during the presentation. Let's analyze what does the Bible say about modern science. First, we deal with astronomy. The Bible speaks about the creation of the universe. In the beginning, first book, book of Genesis, first chapter, it's mentioned. It says, Almighty God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and talks about an evening and a morning, referring to a 24-hour day. Today, scientists tell us that the universe cannot be created in a 24-hour period of six days. Quran 2 speaks about six Ayams, the Arabic word singular is yom, plural is ayam. It can either mean a day of 24 hours or it is a very long period, an yawn, an epoch. Scientists say we have no objection in agreeing that the universe, it could have been created in six very long periods. Point number two, Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, 
verse 3 and 5. Light was created on first day. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14 to 19. The cause of light, stars, and the sun, etc., was created on fourth day. How can the cause of light be created on the fourth day later than the light which came into existence on the first day? It's unscientific. Further, the Bible says, Genesis chapter 1, verse 9 to 13, earth was created on the third day. How can you have a night and day without the earth? The day depends upon the rotation of the earth. Without the earth created, how can you have a night and day? Point number four. Genesis chapter number one, verse 9 to 13 says, earth was created on third day. Genesis chapter one, verse 14 to 19 says, the sun and the moon was created on the fourth day. Today, science tells us that earth is part of the parent body, the sun. It cannot come into existence before the sun. It's unscientific. Point number five. The Bible says in Genesis chapter number one, verse number 11 to 13, the vegetation, the herbs, the shrubs, the trees, they were created on the third day. And the sun, Genesis chapter number one, verse 14 to 19, was created on the fourth day. How can the vegetation come into existence without sunlight? And how can they survive without sunlight? <laughs> Point number six, that the Bible says in Genesis chapter one, Verse number 16, that God created two lights. The greater light, the sun, to rule the day, and the lesser light, the moon, to rule the night. The actual translation, if you go to the Hebrew text, it is lamps. Lamps, having light of its own. And that you'll come to know better if you read both the verses, Genesis chapter 1, verse 16 as well as 17. Verse number 17 says, and Almighty God placed them in the firmament to give light to the earth to give light to the earth, indicating that sun and the moon have its own light, which is in contradiction with established scientific knowledge that we have.